Hello and welcome to Magna Theatre Builder of Worlds. This is uh, an impromptu Burrows and Badgers build. Um, I'm interrupting my Lord of the Rings build uh, for the next week or so. Uh, and I was thinking about going to do some Necromunda stuff. I've got some really cool Necromunda things lined up, so watch out for that. But I was having a conversation with Gary of Black Dragon Miniatures, um, who's sponsoring this episode, um, about the awesome game that is Burrows and Badgers. And he's very keen to do some bat reports and bits and pieces. And he's asked me to make some scenery. So I'm going to be making a haulage yard for Stoke Bart's uh, haulage company uh, for Black Dragon Miniatures. And that's what we're going to look at this time round. It's going to be a model using mostly um, XPS foam, foam core and bolster wood on a hardboard base. Um, we'll have a look at the actual what the model's going to look like in a minute. But first of all... If it's all right with you, I'm going to bang on about B&B for a moment or two. Burrows and Badgers then by Michael Lovejoy is, as you can see, an anthropomorphic animal skirmish game. It is, in my considered opinion, and I've been playing war games for 35 years plus, probably the finest game that I've played, certainly in the last 10 or 20 years, um, including games that I've kind of like written myself for myself. It's charming. Um, there are so many reasons to play this game. If you're into fantasy games, certainly. If you're into science fiction games, pack up playing science fiction games with your tanks and your ray guns and your chainsaws and come and have a bit of this as well. It's absolutely brilliant. These are just a couple of the reasons why I like this game. First, the figure range is fantastic. Michael Lovejoy not only wrote the rules, he uh, sculpts all the figures in the range. And there are well over 100 now, and they are really gorgeous models. They range from tiny little mice, like this little fella here, on his 30mm base, to whacking great big bulldogs, like this amazing model right here. I have the entire range. I've bought every single model over the last two years, including the various Kickstarters that have been done uh, certainly in the last year or so. There is another Kickstarter at some point coming soon, but, you know, COVID and Brexit and all sorts of other things have kind of like thrown that out for Michael, um, which is a shame. Barrows and Badgers is a two-person endeavour, really. It's Michael and his wife, Jo, um, beavering away. Beavering away. I hope you like that. Um, <laughs> here we go. Beavering away in the northeast of England, uh, turning out these brilliant, brilliant figures. The game itself is extremely playable. Um, the buy-in for this game is fantastic. The rules, I think, are 20 or 25 pounds. is a hardback book from uh, direct from Oswald Miniatures, Michael and Joe's company, or from Osprey, who published it in the first place. Um, there is a, another supplement called, called the Warren Percy Affair, but you don't need that straight away. Um, and you can then buy five or six figures for a warband, and you're off which is absolutely great. Another aspect from the figure's point of view and the way the whole game works is the fact that unlike most games which have different factions and faction-specific figures, any figure in the range can go with any other figure, which means you've got absolute flexibility when it comes to wanting to buy the, the toys. You buy the figures, you like the look of more than anything else. And more often than not, when new players say, give me some guidance on how to uh, set up a warband, the overwhelming response uh, from the brilliant B&B &B community is, oh, pick the figures you like. That's the most important element of the game. The game itself is one of those great systems that uh, is easy to pick up, but will take forever to master there are loads and loads of different ways you can play uh it's based around a narrative based kind of campaign kind of thing and some terrific scenarios it is possible if you're a power gamer type i'm sure to sit down and work out all the ultimate combos but that isn't the way i like to play this game this game to me is all about the narrative and how this thing pans out that's pretty much why I bought every figure. And I'm hoping when all this COVID nonsense is over, I'm going to be able to get playing with a bigger group of people than I played with before. And I don't care if they haven't got the toys because I've got them all so they can come and play. So, Gary Guy, I know you're going to be watching this. I can't wait for you to come over all the way from Basildon, even if you walk to come and play with these figures. Um, so, if you haven't 
checked out B&B, please do go to oswarmminiatures.co.uk and have a look at the fantastic range of toys. That's really cool. Um, it's the only place you can get the figures from. Uh, the, it's just not, at the moment, financially viable, I don't think, for Michael and Joe to look at other suppliers. Even with the raise in uh, um, postal costs, especially going abroad now, thank you, Brexit, um, even that is is making things difficult for them spreading out. So do so, please do support this this fantastic game. I've been playing it for two years now, and if I've often said, if I had to stop playing all the other games, even stopping making Necromunda scenery, even not making the Lord of the Rings stuff, if I only had one game that I was going to play from now on, if my wife said, get rid of all the rest of it, or I'm leaving you, then uh, Burrows and Badgers would be the game that would would be chosen and will be staying and will be the one that gets played over and over again. It's absolutely fantastic. Right, there's a little plug, huge plug for Oath Swarm Miniatures. Um, I'm doing that for no reason apart from the fact that I love the game and I think that Michael and Joe need uh, all the support we can give them uh, to keep this brilliant, brilliant game going. Um, they're very much a two-person outfit and Mike's constantly uh, sculpting and writing. It's gagging for... Um, a role-playing game and all sorts of different supplements, um, but he can only do one thing at a time. If you haven't picked it up yet, then notice that is, this is probably like a cross between um, Wind in the Willows and Red Wall and Mordheim, all kind of like rolled into one. It's just for me the perfect skirmish game. Um, it's awesome. Buy it, play it, do it. You won't regret it, I promise. Anyway, back to the model that we're making this week. This then is the plan that I'm, I'm working for, for this model. Um, it's based around, first of all, the needs of this model, which is the uh, Stoatbart haulers. Um, I haven't done mine as Stoatbart, but yes, great fun. Uh, a family of weasels um, who haul, um, Dad Stoatbart and his two boys, um, who haul things up and down. In uh, Burrows and Badgers, there are no beasts of burden, so the beasts do all the pulling. So this is a haulage company. Uh, and they need a haulage yard, and this is what we're going to build. So it's going to be on a 12 inch by 12 inch hardboard base. Um, there are going to be two buildings involved a warehouse and a kind of office come cottage, um, and then a surrounding wall with a bit of a fighting platform here in the door. So, um, looking at it from the side, or well, from the front of the actual yard here, you can see. The oh, this is going to be a stone cottage with a slate roof chimney here, and then the warehouse behind, and then the wall around the outside. The wall around the outside is also going to be of stone construction. And then let's slide this over here, and we can have a look inside the yard. This is kind of like the front elevation of the buildings inside the yard. Um, and I'm making uh, the warehouse, which is going to be stone below and then uh, timber above and then we can see the front of the house here the rest of the yard is going to be um, left fairly bare uh, so scattered terrain can be put in there crates and barrels and that kind of thing I might make some piles of lumber if I get time um, it would also be possible to put a small forge over in this back corner here or it might be quite cool just having a, some kind of tree or something else there but I'm leaving most of that open so Gary can uh, sort that out and make keep that as flexible as he wants for his games so this model then is going to be built in XPS foam for uh, all the stonework and then I'm going to use balsa wood um, probably on a foam core base for the rest and then it'll be cardboard Oh, so, so I'm really excited about this build. It's been some time since I've made any models for Burrows and Badgers. Uh, the last thing I did was a bakery for my urban table, which is probably about six months ago, right at the beginning of when I launched Magrathea Builder Worlds on YouTube. Um, if you're a subscriber, then you may well have seen it already. If you're not a subscriber, or oh, what are you doing? Subscribe now then stop this video and go back and check out my other B, &B videos. There's a build video and there's at least one video which is just a tour of some of my B, &B buildings. I'm going to do a couple more of those just to kind of get them out of boxes and put them on the table and take some nice video and show people what they are because I think they need airing. I've got a lot of burrows and badgers uh, scenery. I really got the bug for this game. I reckon I could probably put out five or six at least tables at the moment that would be suitable 
for boroughs and badges, not including this stuff that I've made recently for Lord of the Rings, which will work perfectly well for B&B as well. I've got so much scenery, in fact, that when all this is over, this COVID nonsense, I'm intending to host a B&B campaign event. Uh, so if you are a B&B player and you fancy that, then you know where to find me here or over at Magrathy Builder Worlds on Facebook. Process. Right. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cut a 12 inch by 12 inch square base from hardboard, which is the base material I'm going to use. I'm then going to take my sketches and work out how they're going to work on XPS foam because that's what I'm using for making most of the buildings. I'll make templates for those and put those on my Facebook page like I have with the Lord of the Rings builds that I've done recently and they are there free for you to use them if you like. I'm going to do all of that inside the house because it's still January and it's still jolly cold out here. Right, let's get building. Here we are with most of the uh, lower wall section drawn out. Uh, out. This is, uh, these are the, the two bottom parts of the gables of the um, warehouse. Uh, these are the front and back walls of the warehouse. I only need to make three walls on the cottage come office. Uh, the office roof gable ends are going to be out of uh, foam as well. The top part of the warehouse is going to be foam core and balsa wood, so I don't need to worry about that. I'm going to draw on the boundary wall onto the XPS foam cut that as well. It's going to be two inches high. So now I've got those wall sections drawn on just over here. Um, long wall section, and then uh, they're going to be one, two, three small bits. That bit isn't anything at all. Um, the next thing I'm going to do, while this is all one piece before I cut anything out, is texture both sides of the foam. Um, and I'm going to do that by using a ball of tin foil. Now, you can get 3D printed texturizing roller things, but actually what I like about this is um, it... Is a bit more random than that. As soon as you start doing a roller thing, you get a definite kind of thing. And the thing about this is all I'm going to do is roll this ball of tin foil over the polyst over the polystyrene, basically. What it does is it slightly compresses the polystyrene, which is quite cool because that makes it tougher. Um, and the other thing is, is it gets rid of this really nice smooth finish it currently has, which will make it more stone-like when I draw stones on it. Um, and... I'll have to do it on the reverse because the whole of this model is going to come apart. You've got to get in. And what will probably happen then is on the inside, we'll have it daubed with plaster or daub of some kind. And that will paint up nicely uh, in a kind of like a whitewashed kind of colour. So as you can see, I hope, it's coming out on there. Zoom in down there. You can see the surface then of the styrene is taking on whatever I get from this tin foil ball and <laughs> through trial and error and learning doing stuff you can either roll it or you can use your hand and dig in and what I'm basically doing is working from what I've learned about working with this stuff which is it's a darn sight easier to do this with all the pieces all together than it is cut out individually. And I haven't even, in most cases, drawn on, uh, certainly to the office cottage kind of bit, in these doors and windows. Uh, I've got to draw those on afterwards as well. The next thing to do after I've done that, let's come back into shot, is going to be to cut out all the individual pieces and texture the cut sections and the tops if they're going to be uh, visible so the uh, these bits here which are wall i'll text to the top of those as well um and then after i've done that i will draw on doors and windows and cut out doors and windows where necessary i've already got these two doors drawn on here for the warehouse big cart doors because my cart's got to be able to go in and out of it this is the stoke bark cart from uh Oastward, so that's going to fit in there nicely um and a small door, so if people want to go in and out of the warehouse, if beasts need to go in and out of the warehouse without opening the main door, they can. Um, and that's a, a one and a half inch tall door. So I always make sure I've got figures around. This is one of the Stoke Bart weasels. Um, when they're not pulling the cart, that's Dad. 
my dad stoked Bart. There we are, putting behind there like that. Fabulous video, weasel with a crossbow. Very dangerous in the game. Um, I always have those around to make sure they're going to fit in the doors, that kind of thing. So I don't need to worry about texturing too much on here. So, finish texturing. Cut it all out. Keep tabs on what's what. Texture the other side. So I'm just going to cut this top bit off and texture the other side. And then draw all the stonework on. And that's the bit that takes pig in ages. Um, but it's very, very satisfying. And for me... I much prefer that than cutting out individual uh, bricks, which a lot of foam workers do, because the bricks always look too big, um, in my opinion. Um, and actually, this is still a damn sight quicker than doing it that way. So, uh, next time, the next bit I'm going to film, I'll have walls, textured, stoned, man, windows and doors cut in. So that's all of the ground floor of the warehouse and the office come cottage drawn out cut out all the brickwork scribes the inside of each building is going to be rendered plaster so it's just staying like that i haven't scribed that wall because that's the wall of the uh, inside wall of the office so now i'm going to stick this all together to the base which is there with gorilla wood glue is my standard glue that I use with XPS foam models like this and I'm going to pin everything together to aid the process with uh, toothpicks cocktail sticks as we call them on this side of the pond and that will be the end of the first stage of this build then I've got to do the exterior wall and uh, make the first floor and the roof for the warehouse and the roof for the office that's the next bit so this is all the lower wall sections done in xps foam you can see all the brickwork there um it's pretty basic at the minute i need to add a roof here uh, a first floor and a roof on this one which is going to be wood and then i've changed the design a bit i'm going to have a wooden surround fence here um i've got to do balsa wood trims in all the doors and bits and pieces so i've still got quite a lot to do in a minute um I'm going to use plastic roof tiles to go on the house down here and make give a different texture, which I think will be quite interesting to paint. It will look quite nice. I'm going to cut the gable ends out to go on the office, uh, and they're going to need more brickwork. So stonework, that's going to take a little while to do, first of all. And then this other end of this piece of polystyrene, I'm going to make chimneys, a well, six-inch tall chimney on the back here. Uh, so this is the uh, office cottage that I've now made a roof section for. Um, pan tiles on this. These are pan tiles. They're from Wells Plastic Card. So this is a railway modelling kit, double uh, O or HO scale, uh, which works perfectly well for what we're doing. You can see inside there's a fireplace in there. Even though it doesn't really matter, I've made a, uh, the chimney go all the way up. Oops, which way? Inside the model there, look. There's the chimney inside. For no reason apart from the fact that it needs to be there, you know. Next job then is a bolster trim around all the doors and windows where I need it and uh, a bolster wood fence around this outside part of the yard. A bolster wood fence cut wood platform for figures to stand on um i've done the balsa fence really just to give a bit of different texture make the whole model a little bit more interesting to look at when it's done that's why the roof of the first floor of the warehouse would be wood as well because it would make it a far more interesting model to look at there's gonna be a sign there it's gonna have stoke bars over the top okay i thought i'd take a few minutes to talk balsa wood for a moment I really like balsa wood as a material to work with um, for doing wood. Um, although I've kind of quite enjoyed carving some wood effects into XPS foam recently, balsa wood, uh, I think, just is the natural thing to use. If you're going to have wood, use wood, especially if you're doing flat, straight surfaces like fences or doors or stairs or that kind of thing. A few things worth pointing out about balsa. Um, first of all, of course, 
it comes in loads of different thicknesses, which is brilliant. Um, and uh, secondly, it can come in a whole range of different prices. My advice when it comes to balsa wood is always go to a proper model shop. Support your local model shop, railway model shop, whichever else. Don't go and buy it from one of these big craft uh, barn type shops like Hobbycraft. Because one sheet of Orbit balsa wood from Hobbycraft will cost you probably three or four times the amount that it will cost you if you go and buy it from your local model railway shop. I've got two model railway shops not too far away from me and I get sheets of uh, balsa uh, probably for about, well it depends on thickness, but uh, less than too good a sheet, whereas they're four to five pound a sheet from Hobbycraft. This is 0 0.8 mil uh, balsa, uh, meter long by nine, nine centimeters wide. And uh, this is brilliant stuff for using our clad uh, phone call with this side, get a wooden effect on the outside of the phone call, but without the expense or effort of having to work with XPS. And this sheet cost £1.39. I don't think we can really see that on the label there, because um, it's written in black biro on here. £1.39. That would cost £2.50 or more from Hobbycraft. This is 2.5 millimetre bolster. That's just £2.20. I, I have paid anything up to five quid for one of these from Hobbycraft. So support your local uh, gaming store, please, guys. Uh, they really, really need our help. Uh, even, well, when well, we're not in the middle of a crisis, but even more so, if you can get to them and they're still supplying stuff online, then please click and collect or, or, or get it delivered. So the fence that I've made uh, that surrounds the outer yard uh, of the haulage yard is made from balsa wood. Mostly from what looks like about 1.5 millimetre thick balsa wood uh, and some square section and uh, balsa that's that looks like about eight mil square section because that's the other really cool thing about balsa you can get it in loads of different shapes um square sections of all different sizes rectangular sections and circular you know cylinders um which are really really handy so i've made fence posts um i've made that is one long piece of balsa wood there but i've put uh, support in the back and i've drawn in the uh, planks i've drawn in and, and worked through with a biro or a pencil and made some holes in these. I've cut away at the top of all these bits to wear them down. I like most of my things to be look, lived in. Um, and I'm going to make uh, a, a platform for the first floor of the house up here, um, or the first floor of the warehouse. And I'm also going to put a sleeping platform uh, into the top of the uh, cottage here uh, to give the... Uh, um, weasels who run stoke barts or somewhere to kip i think it's not necessary really from a modeling point of view but i just want the uh um, gary to have loads of options so we're going to have platforms and, and various other bits and pieces inside in the same way that i've put a firing step kind of platform behind the fence there so smaller beasts can get up and look over the fence as well i will make um, a large set of gates to go in here too i'm going to make wooden doors for the uh, office and for the the uh, warehouse as well and what i'm going to do is i'll put those on cardboard mounting card like this and then um i'll place them cut that to shape and then that will fit in there in fact, okay so now i've got this far with the model i've done the bolter around the outside i've built a couple of doors um i now need to make the first floor of the uh, warehouse and I'm going to make that out of phone core. This stuff. This is a five millimeter phone core, cardboard foam sandwich, polystyrene sandwich. I like using it as it is. It's very good, standard, very strong uh, modeling material. We used to make everything out of phone core. These days, I use XPS foam as well. Um, but uh, the top bit of this uh, building is going to be uh, wood. I was going to make it all out of balsa, but I just can't get hold of thick enough balsa at the moment. So I'm going to make use foam core and uh, clad it in balsa wood and put all the planking into that, which will be absolutely fine. And this will actually make it more sturdy than just making it out of balsa wood itself. So um, you can get foam core from decent uh, art shops, craft shops, uh, and even shops like Hobbycraft. Hobbycraft sell it in big um, A2 sheets, normally four sheets for a tenner, so it's, it's pretty good. Um, you can cut it well. There are some people in the phone building world, I don't know if it's a difference between American phone board and, and UK phone board, but the people in the phone building world who peel off the cardboard 
to get to the foam underneath. Don't know why, I just use five millimeter XPS foam. Um, it knackers the integrity of the foam if you try and do that. The whole strength of this is it's got this cardboard on either side. So I'm gonna draw that out, I'm gonna cut it out, I'm gonna fit it to go on the top of the building, and then I'm gonna clad the whole thing in balsa wood, um, which I will offer the balsa wood up to the different bits of, of, uh, of the different walls and uh, put them on, score on planks, draw that in, put in a few windows and that kind of thing. The first floor of the warehouse is going to be removable um, because then you've got access inside. Of course, everything I make comes apart. All right, so here's the progress where we're at now. Uh, the foam core first floor is done and is clad with balsa all round and the floor inside, balsa two. Uh, all the windows and bits and pieces, tiny little windows, because these buildings don't have very big windows, enough for a character to be able to shoot out of, or see out of in some cases. This one here, purely for letting light in. Um, now, one of the things that I like about making this kind of model uh, are the extra little challenges about how they come apart. I've got to make the roof now for this model, which is probably going to be wooden shingles. Um, I make it, it gets made in card and then wooden cardboard shingles put on the top of it. Now, the thing that I always get to the point of thinking about now is how do I make the roof? How do I make all this model come apart? Because this model comes apart. Um, the roof comes off the little office at the front and the little sleeping platform comes out for maximum access for figures. Um, that roof is just designed just to sit there, butts up against the wall, it's not going anywhere, and the polystyrene holds it. The underneath of this has got a strip of foam core here and one in the corner to help hold that in place so it doesn't get knocked around during gameplay. And I think I'm gonna make the roof on here solid at the back with a lift out panel at the front. So you can get into the top, put figures inside, um, without taking the whole thing apart. And that will give the roof more structural integrity. Every piece of scenery I make is pretty much for a skirmish game, and there's no point in making a, a model this size for a game like Burrows and Badgers that doesn't come apart as far as I'm concerned. You've got to have interiors. The, they've got to be accessible. This is on a 12 inch by 12 inch square. On a B&B &B table, that takes up quite a lot of space. If all of this is just solid, and you have to abstract going inside it, or you just walk around the outside, that's a bit rubbish. Um, so I like my models to really, really come apart and have maximum playability out of this. Also, from a game point of view, I've done other things to this model as well. After the original design, I added another gate in the back of the wall over here, purely because it allows uh, characters in and out to the yard from another direction. It gives you more opportunities when you're writing scenarios and coming up with things. So. Um, that kind of thing is always worth bearing in mind when you're making the scene. So, I'm going to get on the roof now. Uh, it's going to be cardboard, uh, mountain card roof with shingles made from thin cardboard like cereal boxes uh, with a lift out panel at the front. Let's get cracking because it's the last major job I've got to do. Then after all I've got to do then is texture the floor, which is going to be pretty straightforward. I'm gonna... So this is going to be a nice straightforward roof to make this because essentially it's just two rectangles of cardboard. And there's, the back section is going to be permanently stuck on, that's nice and easy. I don't have to faff around with dormer windows or chimneys or anything else, it's just a rectangle um, so of cardboard. A quick measure of the model there, so it's going to need to be what's that, 18 centimetres long. And I'm going to have it hanging over uh, the back just a little bit, so uh, 9 centimetres by 18 centimetres. I'll cut that out and I'm actually going to stick that on to the uh, top of the model. So that's going to be there permanently. I'm then going to have the lip, the ridge come over the top as well. Probably come down the sides on either side and then have a lift out panel here. Um, 
uh, which will sit in place because they'll have the tiles at the top so you stick the, the roof panel underneath it and it will have two little braces to stop it sliding off during the middle of a game. That's the plan anyway. Let's see how that works out. Okay, so here's the whole model pretty much complete now. Uh, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven separate components in this model, which is pretty cool. Uh, I've still got to texture the base using gravel and sand. Then I've got to seal all the polystyrene, prime it, paint it. But next, we've got to go and look for a few details. So it's time to go. Digging through the cack. Oh yes, I haven't done much digging through the cack for fantasy models so far, but there's plenty of cack to dig through. I'm going to be looking for little details that I can hang on walls and use as door knockers and various other bits and pieces. Nothing too much because I don't want to clog up the model. I want it, you know, available for maximum gameplay as such. But I do also want a few extra little things to look at. Um, just to make that model that little bit more interesting before we start painting it and then there'll be a few details to add after we've painted these are some of my old, more better organised fantasy CAC boxes as you can see some of it's kind of organised so I'm going to go for a few bits a few details I'm going to be able to chuck in stick in different corners of this model um, the old barrel I suppose it might be some chest the old sack that kind of thing. I'm particularly looking for some things that will make door handles, um, which is pretty tricky. There are some things though that make very good door handles, which are some of the bits off old Imperial cannons from Warhammer Fantasy Battle from years ago. But I'm just looking for little interesting things that I could stick, hang up outside on the doors, that kind of thing. Really, I don't know what I'm looking for. I've got lots of stuff in here. Um, Sacks and barrels are always good. That's a barrel or some description. That's a nice little resin one. I'll do in one corner. Um, that's <laughs> some dynamite on that one. Maybe not. Um, the odd cartwheel, that will go quite nicely in the corner. There's some metal ones there. You know, because it's a um, haulers. They're always going to need wheels, spare wheels, that kind of thing. So a couple of cartwheels stacked. In the corner, I was going to put a forge um, into one corner of the yard, but I just don't think there's enough room really. That might have to be a completely different model. Um, what do you think, Gary? Forge might work elsewhere. So this is a couple of boxes, a couple of wheels. We've got some pretty big items in here, like. Uh, wells from Mantic Games and that actually is a forge from Mantic Games as well. So the odd tool I just after the little little details that will add interesting looks in places. There's a lantern uh, from Iron Gate Scenery and all the bits that go with that but a couple of lanterns can we see that? There we go. These feature quite a lot on a number of my Burrows and Badgers models. Quite nice little resin lanterns um, and there's a plate and a hook so that can hang from a wall. Um, there we go, there's a plate. I'll see if I can find a hook that goes with it. Quite a neat little thing there. Oh, there we are. They come in sets of five or six there. Really nice little thing, well worth getting there. There's the hook. And there's the plate. Is that all in shot? Okay, so after a short period of cack diving, this is what I've come up with. This is the, this is the, the little extra details that I'm thinking of using on this model. They might not all end up on there, but I'm starting to use some of these. I've got some wheels here, a couple of barrels that are going to go in a corner, some handles to go on a couple of the big doors, the old crate and trunk, um, this lantern set up that's going to hang outside, probably um, the office or mounted on the wall um, in the main yard. Um, that little hook from an old Empire cannon, I've found a little bit of rope that might hang from that. That's from uh, uh, a Lord of the Rings Rohan house. And then this little hook and uh, block and tackle and kit is straight from a Lord of the Rings Lake Town house, which is going to go mounted um, on the outside of the first floor of the warehouse 
which will work quite well as well. Some of these items then I'm going to paint individually and then stick on and other items I will stick onto the model and then it will be part of it. Next step is to uh, add any details and to uh, texture the main part of the base. So that's with coral sand and gravel. Um, then we'll be able to prime. Okay, that's the model primed. Pretty much dry and ready to paint. But before I do that, I am going to have to do some trimming because it's incredible how much thickness putting prime paint on these things can. So everything that fitted beautifully when I had assembled the model, now it doesn't. So this removable roof section, which has this bit under here to hold it all in place, now it doesn't fit nicely. It doesn't fit and slot in, so I'm going to have to take a knife and trim up a bit. It looks all right, but it doesn't fit, so I'm going to do that. And the same with the doors. The doors all fit in nicely, and I didn't allow for the fact that paint was going to add a tiny bit of extra thickness or height or width, so they're now only trimming. After I've done that, I'm going to paint it. When I've done the adjustments, I'm going to start painting. It's going to be a pretty straightforward paint job. Lots of stonework, different greys, woodwork and tiles. And then grass and sand, that kind of stuff. So should be a fairly quick paint job. But I've got to go and make model adjustments first. Curses. Here then is the finished model. All painted inside and out. Signs on. And um, all the details, those tiny little details, or most of them, added. Um, I'm really quite pleased with this model. From the front then, we've got large, heavy set gates underneath the Stoke Bar haulage sign. We've got a couple of little posters hanging on the um, uh, fence there. Then we can look into the yard. We've got the cottage come office on the left there. And we have the warehouse, tall, tall warehouse on the right. Again, more double doors there. This is then the back view, and we've got very plain brick walls and a little um, a gateway into the back side of the yard. So there's no entry on there. Um, nice for actually taking photographs of bits and pieces up against this and would make good kind of like alleys in streets and that kind of thing. And that's the same down this side as well. A few more. Uh, posters added on there some foliage and whatever but that still will make quite a nice kind of like definite delineation for uh, streets and things in a big urban area of course then the whole thing comes apart so if the gates get broken down or opened up we can just remove them i haven't bothered making uh, moving gates on this model they're just so fiddly and they're getting away it's just easier to take them out um, we can remove each one of the doors on the model and we have access into the cottage there we go by taking off the roof we have access into the cottage got this kind of sleeping platform up here um if the client wants he can put beds on there or put storage bits and pieces but that's designed it's just a piece of bolsa that can lift out and gives us nice access to that room if it was mine i'd even end up putting a couple more bits of furniture in that but in some ways it's easier if it hasn't got furniture in because you know it's a tiny little space You'll also note that this part of the building, as quite rightly pointed out by an old college chum of mine, thanks Jeff, um, in reality, uh, this bit of roof here would have water running down into it and would cause a great deal of damp problems along there um, if there wasn't a gutter. Now, if I was building a full-on scale model, I would have built a gutter into that. In fact, if I was building a full-on scale model, I might not have built the wall with that, the roof with that orientation. But this is a fantasy game for fantasy, for uh, weasels um, and ferrets. So from that point of view, I'm just going to pretend there's a gutter there and we'll live with that. Right. We can see from here let's just have a look you can also see um the little shooting step behind the fence here put in there just so the odd character can get up and look over the fence if we want to have some kind of siege type action that's possible round in the yard the details that i've dug out of my cack box with the exception of the lantern which hangs free are all stuck down and are permanent but i've left large amounts of space so it's easy to get in things like the oath sworn 
um, Stoke Bart cart, which also fits into the warehouse. And it's also possible, of course, to fill up with a few bits of scattered terrain, um, which make extra barricades and bits and pieces and will make the whole thing look that much more lived in. That's entirely possible. It's a haulage yard after all. The other doors then are removable, as is the first floor of the warehouse. So now I've got round my uh, not fitting problem. So the top of the warehouse now comes apart. I haven't really bothered painting the inside of the top of the warehouse. It's just black. The wood's all done, um, but the rest of it is just finished black, as is the underneath. The inside of the warehouse itself is whitewashed. We can remove the large double doors, um, which have got nice little handles on for opening them. And the cart comfortably fits inside and out. And again, I've left this fairly detail free inside. So scattered terrain or what have you um, could be placed in it. But it looks really nice. I'm really pleased with all of that. Uh, the little uh, side entrance door here is there because if they need to get into the warehouse and they don't want to faff around opening the big double doors, they're going through this side little, little side one. Um, all around, it's a smashing little model. So let's... Um, Find some B&B &B figures and see what it looks like when it's done up for real. There you go then. So with just a few of the B&B uh, &B figures added to it, you can see, uh, first of all, how charming they all are and how this totally comes to life. Um, I'm really very happy with this model. I think, in general, it looks terrific. Everything goes really well together. I like the fact that there are a number of different textures and colours. I really hope Gary at Black Dragon Miniatures likes it um, and looks after it and gets a lot of use out of it. And who knows, we might make some other bits and pieces for him too. So there you go, that's the end of my Stoked Bart haulage yard build for Burrows and Badgers for Black Dragon Miniatures. I'm really happy with this model. Um, it, I think it really works for, it goes with the, the figure range really nicely. There's loads of playability. There are lots of possibilities for scenarios, which is really important to me as a skirmish gamer. I had great fun making this model. Lots of different mediums, XPS foam, foam core, balsa wood, uh, plastic components, all sorts of bits and pieces have been really good to do. Um, it's been some while since I made a model for Burrows and Badgers, so I've been really pleased to get back into making B&B &B models. I need to play some B&B &B games. Um, I deliberately made it to not quite match the aesthetic of my own uh, Burrows and Badgers um, scenery, any of the different things that I've made for B&B, &B, mainly because I find it easier to let the model go then. If I'd been building this for myself, I would have made some of the shapes slightly different but it would have been very very similar um as it is it's going to be hard to pack it up and send it to uh, gary at black dragon um gary i hope you get a lot of fun out of this and i'm looking forward to seeing it in some battle reports on your youtube channel in the future um i'm going to make some more bnb scenery in the next little while so if you want to see me building other models for burrows and badgers please do make sure you subscribe and uh um Go and select the Barrows and Badgers playlist so you see that. Do that little thing where you get the little bell notification tinkle tinkle thing. That, I don't know. Don't know anything about this YouTube thing. I'm still kind of like fudging my way in the dark really to be quite honest. But subscribe to my channel. Do leave comments down below. And uh, especially if you have liked and enjoyed this video. Uh, like what I've built. Or you've got ideas for other things that I could build for B&B &B as well. Or other stuff you'd like to see in my videos. I don't often make commission scenery. But to be quite honest... My real job at the moment is totally not happening thanks to COVID. So if you do fancy a bit of custom built, unique barrels and badges scenery, do get in touch with me because I am open to offers and ideas. Uh, otherwise, thanks very much for watching Magathu Builder of Worlds. I don't know what's coming next. I might be back in the Underhive down by Pier Town and the Sump Sea. I've got loads, so many ideas for Necromunda. I want to make some more Lord of the Rings scenery. I've just had some 10mm XPS foam arrive to do just that. Um, so watch this space, subscribe, and then you won't miss it anyway, will you? So thanks for watching Magathia Builder of Worlds. I'll see you next time.
that just fell over, didn't it? During that last bit. 